Hi, I'm Leslie Gray. And I'm Joanna Barron. Welcome to the Love and Dividends podcast, where women get smart about money. We'll share interviews and conversations about optimizing your finances, getting started with investing, and building wealth. We're chatting with Danielle Alexandria, a financial educator, life coach, and certified trauma integration practitioner. Danielle spent 12 years working in the financial industry before she started her mission, which is to help women everywhere take full ownership of their financial situation instead of feeling powerless over it. She helps clients heal the root causes of their financial issues and teaches them how to confidently manage their own money, spending, debt, and investing. In today's episode, Danielle teaches us about how our deep-rooted beliefs about money impact our ability to attract and hold wealth, ways to get to the root of your financial beliefs, and how to use setbacks to actually fuel future gains. Enjoy. Okay. Okay. Well, we're so excited to be here today with Danielle Alexandria, who's a financial empowerment coach. Um, I saw her and met her at an event uh, in the fall and just Loved uh, your whole perspective, Danielle, on finances and financial empowerment, but I'm hoping you can sort of take it away and tell us what a financial empowerment coach is and how that would differ from your sort of traditional financial advisor. Sure. Well, thank you for the kind words, Leslie. Um, really, when I started this, the I, w- I was feeling into like, what is the correct title? Because I initially thought I would be just a generic life coach. So I was I was always coming at it from uh, the supportive side. And then my background was in the financial industry, but not actually as a banker on the HR side, interviewing and hiring financial professionals. Um, And then I developed an interest in financial planning myself and had started studying that course um, and then sort of came up with a a conflict of interest, as, as I like to describe it. I just felt that the deeper I got into what was being taught, the more I I saw um, just really an issue. I felt where it was kind of stacked in the house's favor. (laughs) So of course, this is my opinion and my beliefs, but I just felt I couldn't continue with that. So I stopped studying the financial planning course and just continued learning financial education on my own, became what you call like a personal finance nerd. (laughs) And then later, it kind of all came around together. So the, the coaching really just sort of became focused on helping people with money. That seemed to be where the need was and where people were coming to me. So I was like, you know what? It makes sense. I I can help people from um, different angles when it comes to money. So essentially, I came up with that title because to me, I, I feel that the issue is about empowerment. And for so long, money has been a very strong source of disempowerment for a lot of people because Money, pardon the pun, is a very rich topic because it's really embedded in our our very identity, how we see ourselves. So it's to do with things like power, self-worth, freedom. So if we don't feel that inside of ourselves, we are not empowered. And so what I wanted to do was help people overcome these issues so that they can return to the source of empowerment inside of themselves. So money is sort of the tool that I use to do that. Um, so I do two things. Uh, first is I help people deal with difficult emotions towards money and limiting beliefs. So a lot of that is trauma healing, and maybe we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and then the other side is teaching financial education. So, um, I'm not an advisor because I don't sell any financial products and I don't manage any assets. My desire is to empower people by teaching them how these work so that they can manage it themselves. So what I would do is help people understand how to set up a savings plan, how to create a budget that's gonna work for them, how to create a debt elimination plan, and how investing works, and how to make good financial decisions in general. But um, since I don't provide any uh, advice, that means I don't recommend products. Um, And like I said, I'm interested in teaching people how they work so that they can do it themselves. Amazing. And how is uh, also your, I mean, we have to bring up the fact that we're all in isolation. And and so how does that sort of factor into this time? And, you know, how's it going for you personally and and for your financial coaching practice? 
Yeah, to be honest, it's not really any different because my clients are all over the world. Um, so I've been doing this, I've been in this coaching role for about three and a half years. So all of my sessions have been online. So it's really kind of business as usual in that sense for me. Um, so I guess you could say I didn't really have much of an adjustment period because I was already online. Um, what I'm seeing is in general, I, I, I've noticed, you know, because the crisis kind of came on so strong and out of nowhere and has really turned people on their heads. And there's a lot of fear around the economy, not only with health. I, I, I'm seeing like an interest in people learning about financial literacy and realizing like the crisis is forcing them to realize, wow, I really don't know how money works and I need to learn these basic mm -hmm. concepts. So I'm seeing an interest in that, which is great. Um, but then at the same time, you know, some of maybe the more, let's say coaching, uh, interest that isn't necessarily tied to like the really vital stuff has dropped off a little bit as you would expect, you know, so people are spending their money in different ways where it's only on necessities. So, so it's like a decrease in coaching, but an increase in financial education. Well, yeah, I think that's, you know, part of why I went, wanted to have you on and that sort of segues into our next questions, which is how do you find that attitudes towards money um, impact that? So, you you know, I heard you speak about sort of like rich thinking versus poor mm -hmm. thinking, frugality uh, versus waste. And, and specifically, you talked a lot about manifesting money, which I think we find so interesting. Okay, yeah. Is it yeah. possible to man manifest money? <laughs> Yeah. Tell us about it. Sort of a buzzword, <laughs> but I want to hear you break it down because you seem like a woman who mm -hmm. gets down to brass tacks. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. So you're actually bringing up a lot of different things that are really juicy in their own right. So maybe we can go in order. And I think, you know, uh, the first thing you asked about was how attitudes affect our experience with money. And, you know, so I've actually just become something called a certified trauma integration practitioner, which means um, so for the past year, I've been learning about trauma and healing techniques and how to move that energy out of the body, which then frees us up to actually manifest the lives we truly want. And so when we talk about attitudes toward money, I think we have to go deeper than that, because actually what's really going on is we're talking about conditioning, a lifetime of conditioning and programming, which is literally in the cells of our bodies. And that is what's driving our experience. So, you know, yes, thoughts have a definite impact, but it's really something a lot deeper. So it's in our subconscious that's creating the lives that we have. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples to illustrate that. So if you grew up as a child, you know, very poor, so for example, in poverty, and, you know, that was your experience all around you. Um, even if it, later in life you're in a wealthy nation, it will be very difficult for you to create wealth because your conditioning says I'm poor. And to the ego mind, you can't be poor and wealthy at the same time. Um, so what we need to do is go deeper than the, than the attitudes or the thoughts and get into the trauma of childhood and release that from the body. It's actually a physical experience. And then we can actually start experiencing changes. Um, so another example I'll give you, uh, this is really common in many clients that I have, is um, in childhood, they grew up watching family members, for example, lose money traumatically, or it was taken away, you know, in, in like a very emotionally intense event. Well, what's going to happen is there's going to be very strong emotional reactions to that. And the subconscious will say, I don't want that happening to you. So when they get older, they might spend all their money and get rid of it. And then we judge ourselves and think, oh my God, I'm not disciplined. You know, I, I, I make bad decisions and we beat ourselves up when actually the issue is that that conditioning is so strong. So the way trauma works is that as human beings, we're wired for safety. And when we feel unsafe, we will do everything possible to bring ourselves into this state of safety, which is like a relaxation. And if there's trauma, we have fight or flight. That energy is so intense. It will actually cause us to do things to return to safety, like spending all your money so that it can't be taken away. So this is actually what we're dealing with. So we need to go a lot deeper and, you know, have the courage to face some of these old patterns and this old energy that's been with us a long time and move that out of the body 
And then it's not so much about the thoughts about manifestation because we get rid of the faulty programming at the source. So, um, you know, do, does manifestation work? Is that a thing? Of course. But, you know, you could be manifesting all day long in terms of your thoughts and focusing on, you know, I want to be a millionaire. I want to have this and that and and really like put your energy there. But if the if the programming underneath is that it's dangerous to have these things, when you get them, you'll still get rid of them. So I think it's important to really work with the root cause. So that's interesting. So when you look at people like, for example, Jack Ma, the CEO of Alibaba, who came from very modest beginnings. Yes poor childhood and now is a multi-billionaire. How mm-hmm. is that possible? Um, unless he, you know, worked with you, yep. like, cause clearly <laughs> these rags to riches things exist. Like they're, they they're, right. they're the exception, but h- yes. how is that possible? Because the subconscious yep. mind would have picked up, you know, poverty and scarcity. Yes. So what's interesting, it's a great question. So what's interesting is you notice, uh, in families that one of two outcomes is likely either you repeat the pattern of your parents or you rebel against it completely. So there's a lot of people who use like that intense experience and they turn it into a massive success. And I actually believe like that's the challenge and that's the invite we all have as human beings because we all have issues in different areas of our lives. Actually, it's an invite to, to develop the courage, go into it and decide what you will create out of that. So that's why I'm saying like it, you can try and think things into reality, but until you prepare to use the pain as fuel, you see, there's a difference between avoiding going into something painful or uncomfortable and just sort of trying to think things with your mind positively. That's not the same as going into it and using it as a fuel. In fact, Tony Robbins talks mm. about this, you know, is that that's actually like, that's the magical stuff. If, if you can develop the courage to go into it, it can take you very far. Yeah, that really resonates. Like my personal lineage, my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor, came to Canada without a grade school education, couldn't speak right. English, but he just had this fire in his belly and started right. working in construction and then real estate development. And I've just, you know, it was clear that he was just fueled by this mission of like, I survived, it's me against yeah. the world. Um, and he was able to use that to, to powerful effect. Um, but yeah, all of us have our individual circumstances, but there, yes. there's something magical in that alchemy of transforming pain into fuel towards your destiny, I think. Oh, very well said. Yeah, exactly. Oh, well, okay. So, but right now we actually all have sort of a common, I, I don't know if this is the right use of the word trauma or pain we're going yeah. through um, with this virus, with this pandemic. So specifically in this time, do you have any advice of how to sort of maybe turn that fuel into fire or how people should react both in their financial lives and to manifest further wealth? Yeah. Um, I, I think it sort of falls into a couple of categories. So one is around the actual nature of our economy and how the stock market works and looking at the historical evidence to provide comfort. And the other side is things you can do right now to work with your emotions, to work with your energy um, you know, to, to kind of transform that. So it's, it's not kind of building and building and building. And then you have like a nervous breakdown, right? So if we look at just the historical evidence, so, you know, there's a few concepts that, that apply to, to any situation like this. First of all is we know economic cycles are normal, right? So it's like a wave throughout history. You know, we have expansion, peak, trough, and then contraction. And then what comes after contraction is always expansion. It's this rolling wave of cycles. This is normal. We happen to be, you know, in a a contraction, a recession, possibly going into a depression. So we know what's going to follow this is expansion. So this is normal. I think the second thing, you know, investments are creating a lot of anxiety right now and fear and panic because, you know, they're volatile to begin with. And I think it's important to understand some facts around investments as well. So first of all, we know for about the past 150 years that the stock market has returned on average annually 8% a year. So that includes appreciation of stocks plus dividends. Um, now that doesn't mean year to year we make 8% as you know, the last six months are a perfect illustration. You know, last year we're up something like 25, 30% and this year we're down by about the same amount. So that's a, you know, a 50% variance. So 
it's going to look very volatile year to year. However, if you are invested correctly over decades, you're going to approximate that 8%. So it's important to remind ourselves, we don't need to check what's happening all the time. And in fact, I would argue that creates way more anxiety than is necessary. If we know that this 8% over 150 years, which includes recessions, depressions, we're okay. We're going to fall into this pattern, and over time, we're going to get back towards that 8%. The third thing I think for people is, uh, you know, is about risk. So there's sort of two concepts to this. One is just pure timing. Um, because the stock market is risky by nature, you know, ideally, we, we aren't investing for a time period be below five years where we need that money because five years is the benchmark historically, even if there's a big drop. Historically speaking, within five years, you would recover the money you started with five years ago. It's enough time for the stock market to recover. So ideally, you know, people are not investing right now if they need the money one year from now, two years from now, three years from now, that's high risk. So if people are doing that, I would encourage them to stop and go to cash or potentially stop even making contributions right now if you don't need to. So now is not the time to invest unless the money is for long term. So that should alleviate anxiety, right? We're separating the stock market is longer term, it's higher risk. Um, and then around risk as well is now to do with allocation. So also, I think it's important to mention that investing and trading are two different things. And a lot of people see mm. on the TV, very like boisterous, you know, crystal ball predictions, this stock is up, this stock is down, you know, and there's all this noise and energy around it. That is not investing. That is trading. So if people are investing for the long term, that means they're diversified. They have the asset allocation correct, which means they reduce the risk. They're paying low fees. They're in the right types of investments per their situation, age, you know, those kinds of things then they can leave it for the long term. And it goes back to the, you know, the first point around the stock market, where over decades, we don't really need to worry what's happening day to day. Um, and I would actually say to clients, you don't even need to check what's happening month to month, maybe quarterly, maybe once a year is enough. Because if you're invested correctly, we, we go back to the fundamentals. That 8% is going to approximate over a long time. So, so checking it constantly is just going to create anxiety that's completely unnecessary. So, so that's sort of on the financial side is, is get the facts, understand, you know, historically, you know, th these are things are, are working in our favor. And this is just a cycle that's going to change. It's not going to be with us forever. It's not the end of the world. On the emotional side. Um, so I feel like as a society, we are not in touch with our emotions and, you know, we're feeling a lot of stuff these days, right? Which is totally legitimate. So. Anxiety, fear, despair, depression. It's important, I think, not to distract ourselves with TV, alcohol, food, whatever it is we, you know, we tend to do because we don't want to feel these things. And if we can just admit to ourselves, hey, I feel like really depressed right now, or I feel really scared right now. Just if you even just feel in your body, the truth of admitting that to yourself, you're already like on the step, like towards releasing that. And emotions, it's important to remember, they're all temporary. So emotions, I don't know if this is true or not, but I like what it stands for. Emotions, energy in motion. It's a good thing to remind yourself because all emotions are temporary. They're fleeting. And if you remember this and you admit what you're feeling and then you allow yourself to feel it and express it, you're going to release it and come back to a state of calm and safety. So it's like, this is like, a wonderful opportunity for people to learn how to come back to themselves, come back to the present moment where you're safe, where it's okay. You know, these emotions aren't going to run you the rest of your life. Like if you need to cry, cry. If you need to scream, scream. You know, there's various ways you can move the energy out of you so that you, you can try and return to some peace and some safety. So that's, I feel like the, the continual invitation. That's super helpful. I love that. So let's say, um, because you're a financial empowerment coach, I'm going to draw you a composite of somebody who's very much like me, like I was a few years ago, and just see where you would point us um, in order to get started. So let's say this woman is named Jessly. 
Um, and she's in her late twenties <laughs> or early thirties. Yes, Joanna and Leslie Jessley. Um, she's finished yes. maybe business school or law school. She's seeing the end of her student loan debt. She has a good job, but she just doesn't seem to be making any headway in terms of savings, investing. Um, she just seems to kind of be living a sort of paycheck to paycheck in, uh, mm-hmm. situation. And she has no idea where to start in terms of actually building something. And she knows that at some period off the horizon, retirement is going to happen. And the thought just terrifies her. Um, mm-hmm. So where would someone like that start? Well, I think, um, you know, money used to be such a dry technical topic and nobody you know, really had any interest in it. And just you look at the plethora of podcasts, you know, yours included that are propping up nowadays and they're making the conversations fun and stimulating and making it beginner friendly and inviting. Um, and I think that this is starting to change the narrative and interest around learning about money. So I would suggest anybody who's a beginner, it, it podcasts, I think are a wonderful way to, you know, start to learn about these topics. And there's so many, you know, for women specifically that, you know, just, just start you off in a very different place than, you know, thick textbooks that are really dry and boring. So that would be my suggestion. And I think, you know, if you're not investing yet, I would say now is probably not the time to start. Now is the time to learn about investing in financial education while we have time. And then, you know, hopefully things recover, you'll be positioned to take advantage. Now you know what you're doing. You're more comfortable um, because you're using this time to learn about it. And everyone has more time on their hands. So I really think podcasts are the way to go. Now, I don't know if you uh, wanted more specific advice for this particular person. Yeah, I was just, since this is kind of your practice, I just, what mm-hmm. types of things do you look at? Where do you start? Do you start yeah. with the, the mindset stuff? Do you yeah. start with, you know, what did mm-hmm. you learn about money in your childhood? Yeah. That type of thing. Because I think you're totally right that that is fundamental that needs to shift yeah. before the information can even be processed. Totally. So really it's, it's about the individual. So some people will come to me and they really want to work on their mindset. Other people will come to me and they really want to work on some of the financial stuff and other people want a combination. So usually when, um, well, whenever I work with a new client to do a consultation and I, I really just kind of, you know, suss out where they're at, what they're looking for and are they ready to get uncomfortable? That's really the question. And that's something that only each person can answer, you know, because I think it's really important, like I was saying before, to, to use that pain for fuel. But if you're not willing to feel it, then, you know, there's working on your mindset may or may not yield real results because you, you've got to be willing to kind of go there and face some stuff that, you know, you, you haven't wanted to. So it's really about each person being ready or not. So if somebody is ready and wanting to work on the mindset, yes, what I would do with them is I have created something called a money belief inventory. And I list out, uh, read out a list of several statements about money and I have them rank them. And we come up with a top 10 list of what are the strongest limiting beliefs. And then we work with some reflective questioning. Where did this first come from? You know, how old were you when you remember first feeling this way and who was involved and what, what decisions did you make about what was possible for you because of this experience? It's like getting them to start saying like, oh, this happened to me and this is what I made it mean. So we start kind of bringing things into awareness. Um, this is also coupled with, I would do an interview in the first session to learn a little bit more about their experience growing up in childhood with money. You know, what did your mother and father say to you about money? Um, you know, what happened to you? What is your relationship like with them today? You know, how, what about your siblings? What are they like with money? So start covering a lot of things. And also, what does money mean to you? What's the worst thing about money? What's the best thing about money? Starting to get into some of, you know, naming and identifying some of the stuff that's been maybe subconscious, because we generally don't really think much about this stuff, but it's really coloring our behavior. So it's good to bring it to the surface. And then the next several sessions, Basically, I work with what's very present emotionally that has a strong charge, and I work on re- releasing that from the body. So um, it, it, it's it very much got a somatic concept to it. Somatic meaning physical. So energy is stored in the body, including repressed memories, trapped emotions. We work on bringing that up and out. 
and you start to actually move the stuff out of the body. You move the stagnant energy out of the body. Cool. Awesome. So just to follow up on one comment you made, um, you said this is not, if you're, you haven't been investing, this is maybe not the time to do it. Mm -hmm. um, we've heard, we've been speaking to a lot of different experts and obviously it's a debated position, but a lot of people have said to us, this is the best time to start investing mm -hmm. because stocks are, stocks are cheap. So if you can, if your timeline is long, which most, most people in our audience, you know, are 20, 30 plus years off yeah. from retirement. Um, yep. so could you just follow up on that? Why, yeah. why it may not be the best sure. time or maybe it is. The reason I say it's not the best time is because it's also important that you feel emotionally comfortable. Mm. And if you don't know what you're doing and your gut is like screaming at you, I am really uncomfortable. That is, that is something to be listened to over and above what experts are saying. So it's like, you need to be empowered and make the right choices for you, no matter what experts are saying, who know a lot more, who have studied the market, who are comfortable with risk. There's so many variables you don't yet know because you're not educated in this stuff. That's why I say it's a time to learn about it. And when you feel ready, you will know. And, um, you know, in the steps you're taking about people's beliefs around money do you see a difference if you work with men and women and do you think there's oh. some some gendered things because we are a podcast for women and money yeah that's a great question i absolutely do see a difference usually women are coming to me to work on the mindset and you know also learning about investing because there's a lot of intimidation and fear around that um and men will come to me i don't need to work on my emotions you know I want you to look at my investments and give me an impartial opinion. And usually, you know, yeah, they're in mutual funds paying like 2% a year and it's not the right risk. And, you know, I can help them with very practical things. So usually I see a real divide uh, by gender in that way. But I don't want to like stereotype. I mean, I have worked with some right. men wanting to work on more of the mindset. But usually they're just interested in, you know, they can kind of feel like, mm, the advisor I'm working with or the bank, it's like, I don't think this is in my best interest. Can you look at this? Mm. Mm. So, yeah, definitely differences. Yeah. Okay, should we do our money wins of the week? Yes. So we like to bring up a quick tip or something that you saved money on or spent money on that felt good right now. So um, given that it's pandemic time and we're quarantined, what is your money win this week, Danielle? <laughs> um, well, to be honest, I'm not spending very much right now. Um, That's a win. Could be. Yeah. Win. Yeah. Actually, what I've been spending money on are essential oils. <laughs> so what I need to. Oh, cool. Awesome. Yeah. I just ordered like a huge kit from Living Libations, which I love that brand. But let's hear about nice. yours. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I just discovered a brand called Plant Therapy. And so they're out of the States and I ordered a whole whack of oils. I'm interested in boosting my immunity and I'm into natural stuff anyway. And I thought, you know what, now is really the time and I better order like a whole host of things because who knows what's going to happen to the supply chain. So let's do it now, bring them in and I can, you know, spend time learning about the unique healing properties. So yeah, I'm kind of geeking out over oils right now. Mm. They're so powerful. They're like the yeah. distilled power of plants. Yeah. Absolutely. Love yeah. Love it. How about you, Les? Uh, similar theme. It was my brother's birthday. So I wanted to get, he just bought a condo uh, a couple of months ago before this. And so I wanted to get him. Congratulations. Yeah. Oh, wow. Good job, <laughs> Mike. Um, way to go. Uh, so he, so I wanted to buy him an air, a air purifying plant. So I found a company called EcoStems that are based out of Toronto now that are obviously just doing delivery. So I got a couple of plants for him, a couple for me, keep the air fresh, lungs healthy, and just spruce up the place. That was my birthday gift to him and got some for myself as well. Google nice. that right now. Need that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah please do. EcoStems. Yeah. So mine is, it, it's... uh. So it was my birthday a couple of weeks ago and Happy I, birthday. you know, when if there's like something that you want, but it just feels a little too luxurious and you just won't yep. let yourself have it. So mm. with no, me, I don't this know that was, feeling. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, and it's to do with their is. upbringing because it's like, you know, I was raised in a household where it was like, you know, w- the women in my house thought it was frivolous to spend money on personal care and things like that. Like that was not a priority. That was sort of, you know, silly. But anyways, uh, for me, my thing was a diptyque candle. They are the most gorgeous candles. They make your house smell amazing. Um, the jars are beautiful. So I bought myself this limited edition Pallion Fleur. It's like a stained glass uh, jar that when it burns out will be beautiful for makeup brushes and just feels so luxurious. And I yeah, ordered it from Holt Renfrew for my damn birthday. And it felt Ooh. great. <laughs> you know and it's what, also though, like I... sometimes you should just get the thing you want rather than yeah. get 10 cheaper things that aren't this is exactly what i was want. gonna say yeah you know, yeah i'm really you glad you did that i'm really glad you did that and this is like one of the concepts that i i really focus on when we're talking about budgeting and spending money because there is there is an art to it and it's not about deprivation and i realize i didn't answer your question about frugality so this feels like a perfect opportunity Great. um you know, I, I think when it comes to spending, you know, what I what I like to lead with is pleasure. And as long as you're living within your means, which means that you can afford it without going into debt, then it's okay. And it's good to give yourself pleasure. So when you're in safety, you know, linking back to that conversation we had about trauma and safety, trauma is the feeling of being unsafe. And you cannot relax and you cannot experience pleasure if you're not feeling safe. So when you feel pleasure, you're in relaxation, which is so healthy for you, right? You're going to attract more of the good stuff. So yes, that is, that is true. It does work that way. So with spending, you want to actually be very clear on what is deeply meaningful to you and what gives you joy. And what is the stuff that's kind of, meh, yeah, I could buy this, but you know, within like a day, uh, whatever, it's, it's just nothing anymore. So what's the point of spending the money on that stuff? Spend the money on the stuff that is going to bring you joy, you know, more than 24 hours. That's, you know, bringing meaning to your life. And by not spending it on the stuff kind of mindlessly, that it's very easy to do, you can redirect those funds towards saving, towards paying down debt, towards investing. And you're going to enjoy your life more. You're, you're aware of where your money is going. You're more empowered. You see what's happening. You're making better choices. You're going to feel better. So it's just like this continual cycle that's positive. Um, and on frugality, you know, I think we have to be careful with this concept. And it's something, you know, you're familiar with the FIRE movement, financial independence, retire early. Mm-hmm. So some of these people, you know, it's um, our, the concept is, you know, save like ridiculous amounts of money when you're in your 20s and 30s and retire very early. Like some of them are saving 50 to 70 percent a year, which is astronomical. I don't personally recommend that, but to each their own. And then and the only reason- buy like brown bananas at the store and live on ramen noodles, <laughs> even though they're like lawyers who make six. No, literally, there are blogs of yeah. people who do this. I'm yeah. fascinated. And by no heat. Yeah. They don't turn on the heat. Uh, That's another big one yeah. in yeah. Canada. They try to wait as long as possible uh, for yeah, heat. No yeah, no thanks. No thanks. I like my heat here. Uh, <laughs> but the, the so the issue with frugality is it can look again. This is my belief. It can look like you're being really resourceful very smart, you know, look, I spend my money in such a clever way. I get the best deals. I'm this, I'm not. But let's remember, we can just expand the box. It doesn't have to be so small. So in a way you're enforcing a scarcity to work with in the first place. So like, be careful of the energy you're coming from rather than ways to increase your income rather than ways to, you know, like expansion rather than just, you know, hunkering down and, and like, being very, um, a lot of energy over every dollar you spend. Is that the energy that you want to put out in the universe? Yeah, mm. totally. Mark Zuckerberg is not tracking every apple that he buys. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> His energy is going somewhere else. <laughs> oh, that's right, true. right. Totally. Yeah. yeah, so I think we just have to be mindful and remember that, you know, energetically, you know, the world is abundant. So we just, you know, just ask yourself, how does abundance feel, right? It feels like expansion. It feels like ah, plenty. It feels like, you know, freedom. It feels like warmth and openness. So anytime we're kind of hunkering down, we're dealing with the opposite energy, which is scarcity. There's always ways to generate more money, even in a poor economy. But it might take some research and trial and error to see what works for you. 
So I think we just need to remember that that's always available for us. We have to choose it though. Fantastic. I think that's a great place to, to end here uh, with love and dividends. Thank you so <laughs> much, Danielle. Love and dividends. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah, so great. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much for listening to the Love and Dividends podcast. If you got value from this podcast, please share it with another woman who could benefit from the information that we shared. And please consider rating us and leaving us a review on iTunes. It really helps with new podcasts. If you have questions about finances and investing, have suggestions for future topics or guests, please let us know. You can shoot us a DM on Instagram, love and dividends, or you can send us an email at hello at loveanddividends.com. With love and dividends.